Hi all, and welcome to Chess News number 41. In this episode, I want to spend some time looking at some games from the 2011 US Chess Championships that are currently being held in St. Louis, Missouri. So far, two 19-year-olds have drawn all the attention, both from the qualifying group B, Grandmasters Robert Hess and Grandmaster-elect Sam Shankland. With strings of nice wins, these two young lads have made it through to the semi-finals. It seemed, however, that their more experienced opponents underestimated them in some games, letting them win rather easily. First, let's look at Shabalov versus Hess from round 4. It seems that Shabalov does some experimenting in the opening, and on each move gives Hess a little more of what he wants. Ok, here we go. e4, and Hess responds with e5, knight f6, knight c6, d4, Shabalov opts for the Scottish game, e takes d4, knight takes d4, knight f6, the other uh, important main line is of course bishop c5, and now play continues with the main line, knight takes c6, b takes c6, e5, attacking the knight on f6, but for the moment black pins that pawn to the king on e1 with queen e7. Ok, now comes queen e2 unpinning the pawn and renewing the threat to the knight on f6, so the knight jumps into d5, and now again white attacks the knight with c4, but here is a counterpin yet again, bishop a6. Ok, now there's already uh, something uh, funny if we look at the interaction uh, between bishop a6 and the pawn on c5 and behind that the queen on e2. Uh, of course for the moment uh, white cannot take on d5 because his c pawn is pinned. On the other hand, and we will see that uh, later on in the game, the bishop on a6 is unprotected. Ok, play now continues with b3, one of the main uh, lines preparing bishop b2 over protecting the advanced pawn on e5, g6, preparing to counter Fionchetto and uh, attack again this uh, pawn on e5, so f4 over protecting, knight b6 is now played, g3, castles, and bishop b2. Okay, and with his next move, black finishes his development, bishop g7, and um, you could say that he has the better of it uh, as far as development is concerned, but if we look at the pawn structure then we can see that white's pawn structure is of course superior to black's. He has only two pawn islands and black has three pawn islands. Uh, the pawn on a7 is weak, there's double pawns on the c file and um, even though it may be true that Black has finalized his development, it also remains to be seen if the bishop on a6 and the knight on b6 will be active anytime soon. Because uh, currently they are just yeah, looking against this bind and they don't really have any active possibilities to go forward. So only later on in conjunction with a move d7, d5, black uh, may hope to put some pressure on c4, uh, which is a very important pawn to keep all those black queenside pieces at bay. Okay, now Shabalov's next move I wouldn't say is a mistake, but it is a move that somehow surprised me a little bit. He played knight c6. And the reason why I don't like uh, knight c3, excuse me, is that it blocks in the bishop, and the bishop was important in overprotecting white's uh, spearhead, if that is a correct word, on e5, you know, the, the advanced pawn on e5. So, um, also, we see that white's knight does not have a whole lot of. Um, opportunities uh, for the future. The only reasonable square would be e4 and uh, from there it would have some future of course. But you know the knight could also jump to e4 from d2. So let's say if white had played knight d2 
then at least uh, the connection between bishop b2 and the pawn on e5 uh, would remain intact. And apart from going to uh, e4, white would also have options of bringing his knight to f3 and then maybe to d4 uh, and so on later on uh, in the game. Last but not least, from d2, the knight is also overprotecting this all important uh, c4 pawn. Well, like I said, knight c3, we return to the game, is not really a mistake, but I think I would have preferred knight d2. But of course, all these lines are very well analyzed, and it's perfectly possible that Shabalov just wanted to try something else and confuse his uh, opponent uh, by playing the less regular knight g3. Okay, now with d5, has more or less equalizes uh, the position. It makes perfect sense that now that he is overdeveloped, that he should also uh, induce some tension into the position, try to open up the position and uh, attack this pawn on c4. Now it would not be wise really to take this pawn because after queen takes d6 <coughs> all these central files have become open, you know, and white is uh, severely underdeveloped so in this case, uh, black would really take over the initiative, despite being a pawn structure down, you could say. So in this position, uh, the dynamic factors uh, are more important. Okay, so we go back to uh, d5, and white very wisely just continues with his development. Uh, bishop g2, still keeping up, uh, keeping options open, whether to castle kingside or queenside. Okay, rook h e8 is now played, and um, again Shabalov plays a rather interesting and sharp move. He chooses here to castle kingside, but somehow, to my mind, it looks more safe and sound to castle queenside. Uh, first of all, if we look at the position of white's rook and king on f1 and g1, we can see that in the future... Um, they will possibly be harassed by the black bishops. Now, if white castles queenside, then he doesn't really have this problem uh, anymore, of course, and this somehow looks safer to my eye. Still, we cannot say that castles kingside is a mistake, but black now really takes over the initiative by uh, attacking white's advanced pawn on e5, and he does that with the thematical f6. Okay. Um, well, it seems that um, Shabalov now again makes a mistake, or at least an inconsistency, um, with playing a4. This move, of course, aims to attack the knight on b6, but on the other hand, you could also think that it pushes the knight to better squares, since the knight is not really active right now on, on b6. Um, it seems that this move is a time loser. I think the best move would have been e takes f6. And now the funny thing is that um, queen f6 is best for black when queen f2 holds the balance, really. Because after e takes f6 and queen takes e2, it is in fact white who has the better of it. And there is a very nice line that I want to show you. Of course, you have to recapture uh, your queen. And now your bishop on g7 is hanging. But, you know, you could um, decide to counterattack with rook takes e2. And after f takes g7, take yet another piece on v2. But then, f5 is a tremendously strong move, simply winning the game for white, despite being the fact that he's a piece down, and due to the fact that these two pieces, one of which is black's extra piece, are not playing at all on the king side. f5 is probably the best way to go, because it uh, threatens to advance with f6 when you would have two crushing uh, connected uh, passers, of course, but also it prepares uh, to bring in uh, white's rooks over the f file. So play would continue g takes f5, rook takes f5, and uh, we can see already that um, 
why this threatening moves like rook f8 so you would have to defend that square but then white just brings in the other rook and now you can uh, try and quickly uh, bring back this rook to the defense but bishop h3 adds some more uh, pressure on the black position after king b7 rook f7 doubly hitting this knight it becomes clear that white is winning because if the knight moves then white will simply play rook f8 and uh, queen on the next move okay there is a more trivial way of winning this position f5 is probably the strongest also possible would be the very simple bishop h3 king b7 now just simply threatening to promote which would win at least the exchange and um, that should also lead to a winning position for White, uh, even though his technical task would be uh, a lot more difficult. However, after f6, uh, Shovelov did not play e takes f6, he played a4, which to my mind is a bit of a time loser. And now instead of um, taking himself on f6, Black is able to take on e5. And already Shabalov cannot really recapture because after f takes e5, the bishop on e5 will become a monster. Um, the threat uh, is bishop d5, and if you just simply try and sidestep that with king h1, which you will probably have to do sooner or later, then simply d takes c4 leads to a huge um, uh, advantage for black. Well, you cannot recapture on c4 due to bishop uh, c4 winning at least the exchange. So a5 would make sense um, in this case. But then after bishop c3 in between queen e7, rook e7 and bishop c3, knight d5, hitting the bishop on c3, it becomes apparent that after bishop d4 and c takes b3, when black is also hitting the rook and is up three pawns, that he has very good winning chances. Things may not, still not be so easy if white uh, saves his rook because he still has a very, very, very strong bishop of the black squares. But, you know, with uh, black's rook so uh, centralized and being up three, uh, three pawns, I think black has very good winning chances. So after f takes e5, f takes e5 is already not a very good opportunity. So Shabalov must have, you know, been thinking, okay, what am I, what am I doing here? Maybe I should play f5. But relatively best was probably bishop h3 check, and that's that's the the thing with these uh, Scottish positions. You know, somehow positionally they don't make any sense whatsoever. And then after king b8 a5 knight c8, it would seem that. Um, White is keeping Black's advantage uh, at bay, at least. Okay, well, in the game after f takes e5, Shabalov played f5, when Hess simply took, and after rook takes e5, uh, took a timeout with king b8, sidestepping any bishop h3 moves. Also, e4 immediately would already have been uh, very good, but king uh, b8 also uh, hangs on to the advantage. Even though white could have tried a5 now, after all. And after knight c8, something like knight a4. And he may hope to get some counterplay on the black squares in this position. First of all, he's pressuring e5. And he's also preparing to play queen f2, uh, getting out of the pin, um, the pawn on c4, that is, and also preparing uh, such moves as knight to c5, when the knight would be very active and, of course, hitting uh, this bishop on a6. Uh, however, mm, he didn't play a5, and after king b8, he played queen f2 immediately. But there is a difference now, and the difference is that after e4 and now a5, which is the game, black has the in-between e3. And, um, well, it becomes clear now that Shabalov is sitting on the wrong side of the board. 
probably most tenacious would have been to play queen c2 which keeps the bishop on b1 protected and also um, you know gives blacks uh, excuse me white's rooks an opportunity to keep communicating with each other but after e3 he opted for queen e1 allowing um, well even better uh, coordination for black's army and uh, destroying his own coordination really now uh, black took the time out to play knight c c8 but of course his knight wanted to go to d6 hitting white rook on f5 so that's not a, a lot of tempo lost because it will come with tempo gain on d6 and now uh, again something like rook b1 over protecting the bishop on b2 would have been best but somehow Shabalov now crumbles with c takes d5 opening up the bishop for this strong uh, opening up the diagonal excuse me for this strong bishop on a6 and um, well it must have been pretty easy now for for Hess to find uh, a winning continuation he just simply played e2 which frees up the e3 square and uh, threatens the horribly strong queen e3 check harassing uh, white's king and also uh, attacking white's knight on c3 so Shabalov uh, sidestepped that check but now since white's rooks have no coordination whatsoever uh, has simply shifts to the f file which is uh, of course a very important file um, it attacks the white rook and if white were to take that rook excuse me rook takes f8 and rook takes f8 then um, black would have exchanged off one of white's active pieces and now he has a very strong one against a very passive one and uh, white can also not take on e2 and it would only be a matter of time with such moves as queen uh, e3 and rook f2 etc before he would be uh, winning if necessary black can also bring in his knight uh, you know to um, add to the pressure however after rook f8 Shabalov chose to uh, hang on to the f5 square but here comes knight d6 you know simply hitting the rook and uh, well with queen f2 Shabalov decides to give the exchange but it's uh, um, it's no good because after knight takes f5 g takes f5 and rook takes f5 he cannot even recapture on f5 because of e1 queens so this is where Shabalov uh, resigned he somehow handed uh, has all the play in the center uh, by playing a little bit too hesitantly I think in such a sharp uh, position um, probably the most important moment was here when after f6 he played a4 and Hess could take over the initiative in the center and then um, I think that maybe also queen of two was not uh, the best probably a final chance would have been a5 knight c8 and knight a4 because after queen f2 the game e4 and a5 e3 nice in between move was possible and um, well especially after queen e1 it was downhill rapidly for Shabalov okay well having discussed this game let's uh, continue to uh, the next game that I want to uh, discuss excuse me um, so in this next game between Kaidanov and Shankland white plays rather uncharacteristically I'd say for GM uh, both of white's bishops get sidetracked whereas blacks decide the day it's a very typical thing uh, to see happen and then um, when there is this uh, significant imbalance between both sides bishops white uh, um, probably also oversees a very nice but not too difficult trick by black and can more or less resign immediately so uh, Kaidanov opted for d4 and Sam plays d5 so they play a few moves of Slav theory here they go into the well-known Meraner and after queen c2 which is one of the main uh, moves uh, Sam plays a, a bit of a sideline 
Um, normal move here would be to play bishop d6, but he plays b6, preparing to fianchetto his uh, bishop and b7, which is uh, very playable also. Bishop d3 was played, bishop b7, castles, and now bishop e7. Um, a rather um, modest setup, but uh, good enough. And now, here is an interesting moment. I think, um, but who am I to criticize Grandmaster Gregory Kaidanov? I think that b3 is not a very useful move if you want to fight for an opening advantage. Um, it's a well-known move, of course, and um, it also prepares the fianchetto, the bishop, to b2, um, thereby finishing the development. But to my mind, the bishop on b2 is not a very good piece. And also the move on b3, it, it loses time, even though it supports the center when white would be able to recapture on c4 with his b-pawn if black were ever to decide to capture on c4. But I don't think that black has to capture on c4 anytime soon. Rather, I think he will opt for a counter break, the c6, c5, as we will see sooner uh, or later on in, um, in the game. And instead of b3, he might try such moves as rook d1 or h3, you know, which is very important uh, later on in the game. Uh, sidestepping such moves as knight g5, or maybe just play c takes d5 and try to get an advantage uh, that way. Anyway, b3 was played, and uh, Shankland castled, and now knight e5 was played. Of course, bishop b2 would have been possible, but knight e5 is also um, a nice move, um, making use of the fact that black cannot really uh, take the knight because after this and then this this pawn is a goner of course and white has a significant advantage if not winning already in the long run so after knight e5 uh, sam first decided to play h6 now maybe threatening with knight takes e5 which explains why kaidanov uh, reinforces the knight with f4 but even though the knight is sitting there very nicely on e5, um, the pawn structure is not really in white's favor. He has played quite a lot of pawn moves and still his rooks are not connected and his bishop is still sitting on c1. And um, he also doesn't have any uh, direct threats yet. And Shanklin now really completely equalizes with c5 making use of the fact that uh, these white pawns in the center on the black squares eyes are somewhat weak and um, also trying to uh, put some life in his position um, you know make his knight on d7 and his bishop on e7 work and i think that maybe because of this aggression on the black squares that Kaidanov could have opted for something like king h1 which is always a very useful uh, prophylactic against such uh, future possibilities of the bishop appearing on c5 or uh, knight f3 um, you know just simply getting out of the grip from this knight on e five and over protecting uh, d4. Now this move looks a little bit weird but after c5 Kaidanov plays the um, optically very logical bishop b2 but this can already be considered a tactical mistake um, and something not very difficult uh, to understand on the grandmaster level I would say because now after c takes d4 just hacking away on these black squares Shankland uh, already has quite a nice uh, initiative and advantage. Now, yeah, I suggest we just recapture that pawn, right? Which is what Kaidanov did, e takes d4. But now d takes c4 makes much more sense because there will be a discovered attack against the unprotected, uh, excuse me, unprotected pawn on 
uh, on d4, which is a direct uh, consequence of the fact that this pawn is no longer sitting on f2, and that um, the knight is no longer protecting because it jumped into f5. And also the bishop is not really uh, defending the pawn because the knight on c3 is in the way. So there are three options to recapture on c4. And um, if Kaidanov did not want to lose this game, he should have gone for b takes c4 or knight takes c4. Let's first see what happens after b takes c4. Because um, at first sight this just simply uh, seems to at least ruin his pawn structure or lose a pawn. Knight takes e5. And now it's important to note that d takes e5 is not possible due to this check, king h1 and knight g4. You know? And, uh, excuse me, <coughs> black has everything he's hoped for. He's uh, he's winning this position, um, which um, reminds me that you know when I pointed out that king h1 and a little bit later h3 would have been useful moves in these positions, uh, you can see now why. Uh, so after knight takes e5, he would have to go for f takes e5, not allowing bishop c5 check, but of course then queen takes d4 check, simply wins a pawn. But after king h1 things are not so simple because white is still uh, attacking the knight on f6 and also indirectly attacking the queen on d4 so he's threatening some discoveries with that knight on c3 and after knight g4 which is probably then the best way to go knight e4 over protects the f2 square and hits the queen so uh, we still have some complications uh, in the game. It's not very clear that black is indeed much better here. He would have to retreat the queen, let's say, to uh, queen d7. But white could continue uh, to confuse the issue maybe by simply attacking this knight. And where does this knight have to go? It cannot go back to f6. So, um, yeah, it's all a little bit problematic here for for black but well okay maybe for me these lines are a little bit difficult to see but for a grandmaster i mean i i, I spent some time analyzing this position you know but over the board um i think a grandmaster would be able to see this or should be able to see this anyway after d takes c4 which is what shanklin played in the game um kaidanov did not go for this b takes c4 uh, complications and um, I think if he didn't like them, then at least he should have played knight takes c4, which sidesteps uh, knight takes e5 on the next move by Shankland. Because in the game, Kaidanov played bishop takes c4, and this is just simply a losing move. And this probably has to do with the fact that he overlooked a nice trick. And also, and we will point that out uh, soon, that, well, his bishop on b2 is just simply bad, and now his bishop on c4 is also bad, you know, they're just... If they're not looking against black's piece, then at least <laughs> this bishop is looking against three of his own pieces, and this bishop is fighting on granite um, as far as black's position is concerned, you know, just the pawns on e6 and, uh, and f7. Um, on the other hand, this guy is just raking down the board, and this guy is also ready to uh, come in with great strength. So, black's bishops have, have a much better future than white's bishops. And, uh, of course, uh, Shankland continues here with knight takes e5. Again, d takes e5 opens up the diagonal for the bishop to check here, and after king h1 and queen h4, well, I created so many colors and arrows indicating that black is uh, is winning here um, that um, I will not go into any detail any further. This is just a simply winning position after knight takes c4. There are simply too many threats here that white has to deal with. So after knight uh, takes e5 the game, uh, Kaidanov had to go for f takes e5, maybe still hoping, you know, for the fact that here 
Um, the knight is attacked and also indirectly the queen is attacked and that after king gauge one which is the move he played in the game that Shankland would have to try and grovel his way out of this double attack but Shankland very coolly calmly and collectively played queen h4 and this is probably what Kaidanov missed because if he now were to take the knight then all of a sudden bishop d6 simply wins the game for black and again we see the enormous strength of this bishop pair raking down the board pointing towards white's uh, king side whereas these two fellows have uh, nothing to say about the matter whatsoever um, of course uh, the point after h3 is that king uh, queen takes h3 check king g1 bishop c5 check queen f2 queen takes g2 is check mate so after queen h4 kind of probably realized that e takes f6 is just not possible and uh, therefore he opted for bishop c1 um, which is a blunder because uh, he should have played queen f2 really which is by far the toughest way to counter black's plan but of course after queen takes f2 rook takes f2 and knight e4 black has all the winning chances here with his uh, superb bishops and of course his extra pawn but of course he would have to show a lot of uh, extra technique which was not needed in the game after queen h4 and bishop c1 which made his task even more easy so he brought in yet another attacking piece and okay Kaidanov is still in time to overprotect h2 but after bishop c5 uh, he resigned there were just too many threats and um, well for instance bishop g3 could have been played to keep this guy guarded but also the f2 square but in this case uh, black would have the very nice rejoinder and knight e3 hitting the queen and the bishop and also let's not forget that the weak pawn on g2 and after bishop h4 and knight takes c2 um, black would be hitting also the a1 rook after rook a c1 he would just return to sender um, double attack the rook on f1 the pawn on uh, g2 so after rook g1 and now for instance knight takes c4, b takes c4, g5 he has a very simply winning position he can pick up uh, the exchange on g1 on the next move um, he is also a pawn up uh, this is just a very simply winning position for black so um, that made Sam Shanklin progress in the standings of course and uh, both guys made it to the semi-finals in which uh, Robert Hess today has to play a rapid playoff against Yuri Schulman from the VA group is that yeah and um, unfortunately for Sam yesterday he lost to Gata Kamsky he was just simply outplayed in a Sicilian endgame where Kamsky had the two bishops and at a certain moment in time also an extra pawn uh, which he uh, very uh, convincingly converted into a win so today is the the day of the playoffs uh, it's crush against uh, Tsatonsky and uh, Schumann against Hess uh, to decide uh, on the final places for the finals okay well that brings us to an end uh, for chess news number 41 I hope you've enjoyed this one learned something from it and uh, until next time this is Valdemar your host signing off bye bye